Hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to talk. I don't, can't imagine what we'll talk about, but we're going to talk uh, for probably maybe 40, 45 minutes. Uh, and then we're going to open it up to some questions. So if you have questions, you can use the Slido system at slido.com, and I'll um, read the best ones. Uh, how's Texas? Texas has been great. I've been here all week. I uh, started in Dallas, been to Houston, San Antonio. I've had a lot of barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the highlight here is... Hey, do you have the barbecue because you want the barbecue, or you feel compelled to have barbecue because it's like a very political... I, I compelled to have the barbecue, and I learned <laughs> do not go to barbecue when you're really hungry. Yeah. It could be a problem. It can be a big problem. Uh, you, uh, the response I understand from the folks you met with in Texas has been good. You met with veterans? Yes. The response when you launched this campaign, uh, not campaign, rather pre-campaign, uh, a few weeks ago, seemed, at least in the media, to be somewhat less favorable. Were you expecting that backlash? You think it's been less favorable? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. It's quite an honor. Thank you. Well, let's go back four to five weeks and kind of replay what's taken place. Uh, five weeks ago, I had the opportunity with Scott Pelley to be on 60 Minutes, and I, I said publicly that I was seriously considering running for president as a centrist independent outside of the two-party system. And I said that because over the course of the last year, uh, as I've examined and traveled the country, I began to realize that the challenges and the problems facing the American people, the fracturing of trust and confidence in leadership and in government, is not just because of one party or just because of the lack of dignity and respect and character of this president, but I've come to the conclusion that the two-party system uh, for all too long now uh, is broken and the level of dysfunction and polarization and revenge politics has reached a level in which I think we are on the clock as a country. Uh, we're sitting with $22 trillion of debt uh, that I think is immoral because it's, on, it's going to be on the shoulders and the backs of our kids and our grandkids. Uh, we have a immigration system right now that has been weaponized as a political problem that should be solved in a humane way. Uh, we have a healthcare system, an education system in America that's not working. And certainly our standing in the world uh, under this president uh, has been uh, placed in a position where I think it's very fragile and we've lost the trust and confidence uh, of our allies. But at the core of it all is a lack of leadership. And for any of us in the audience who are young entrepreneurs, uh, who are part of an organization or a business, uh, you look at the country right now and it's, it's just not working and we all know something's wrong. And at the core of what's wrong is the fact that we have both parties at the extremes steeped in a level of ideology and self-interest and self-preservation that is overriding their core responsibility to all of us. And it's not that I'm running, if I run for president against the Democratic Party, if I run for president, I'm running because I love the country, I'm profoundly concerned about where we are, and the two-party system is broken, dysfunctional, and, not, and in need of great repair. So th this message, uh, this sort of message of common sense centrism, uh, I, I do believe that it has a lot of play. And, and you know, there was, we were talking about this backstage. Uh, Tim Wu, the legal scholar, just wrote a really great essay for the New York Times in which he's called The Oppression of the Supermajority. And what he said is that the story of our time is not actually hyperpartisanship. The story of our time is that a few hyper vocal partisans are, are um, strangling the will of the majority, which actually agrees in, on, on a number of bipartisan policy proposals. All of that said, you, have a, you actually have a great turnout. You filled the room here. But you know, when AOC comes here later today, when Elizabeth Warren comes here later today, I mean, the lines are going to be around the block. If President Trump 
I, I don't think President Trump's ever going to come to South by Southwest. <laughs> but you, you, you're familiar with the, the incredible amount of not just support, but engagement he gets from his core audience. So I, I guess my question is, for all that talk of the common sense proposals, it does feel like the people who are really capturing the national imagination, either on the left or the right, are those hyper-partisan voices. Well, that's true. Uh, I, I think uh, we, you know, we're living in a, a society right now where you can send a tweet about anything and get 10, 15, 20 million followers, and all of a sudden you're an iconic celebrity. Uh, I understand that, but that's not going to solve uh, the issues that we're facing. Uh, the issues that we're facing as a society and as a country are real, they're serious, and they need thoughtfulness, they need discipline, they need leadership, uh, and it's not a tweet that's going to solve the problem. So let's, let's just take a couple of, of things that have come up in the last couple of weeks. First off, uh, l let me be clear, I, I think uh, the people that you've mentioned are all well-intentioned. Uh, they, they love the country, they have their core beliefs, uh, but you have to ask yourself, is any of these things possible? And is, is, is it realistic to think that these things can be achieved? So when the Green New Deal was outlined and uh, a number of Democratic elected officials signed on to it, uh, what I did is I immediately got it and read it line for line. I wanted to know what was in it. I wanted to know whether it was real, realistic, and it could be accomplished. So. Uh, I, I mentioned we're sitting with $22 trillion of debt. Uh, under this president, we're adding a trillion dollars of debt a year. You should know that we're spending $500 billion in interest expense, and for the first time in America's history, our national debt is larger than the entire U.S. economy. You should also know that during the time that President Obama was president for eight years, the Republicans banged on him every single day, McConnell, Boehner, and then Ryan, every day to reduce the debt, reduce the deficit. President Trump becomes president, and for two years, Republicans do not say one word, not a word, about the national debt because it's not in their political favor to do so. But you can't try and solve one extreme with the other. And now we have a new extreme, and it's the Democratic platform. Now, I, I said these are well-intentioned people, but I have a right to disagree with what they are proposing. At the core of our country, which is foundational, is a free enterprise system which is core to our democracy. For us to start moving towards a level of socialism is such an extreme position and something that I think is inconsistent with the values and the heritage and the tradition of the country. And that is what Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and others are proposing, to try and defeat Donald Trump with a far extreme proposal. If Donald Trump runs against one of those types of candidates, it's my belief that Donald Trump will be reelected, that the vast majority of Americans are not going to embrace socialism. Going back to the Green New Deal, in the Green New Deal, there is a proposal that says that by 2030, Every building in America is going to be transformed to clean energy. Now, that's a well-intentioned idea, but it's never going to happen. So my question to the people who are proposing these things is, let's propose things that are true, that are honest, that are sincere, and that are realistic. Just to put the math in, in context, that would mean that 2,700 buildings a day between now and 2030 would be transformed, and the government doesn't own those buildings. So they would have to mandate, and the cost to it. And so these issues that have to be resolved and solved require a centrist position. There are good people on both sides of the aisle that if they came together and left their ego and ideology out of the room, and we had the right level of leadership and commitment to solving the problem, I believe we could begin to create a scenario in which the American people would be served and served much better than we are right now. Some of the facts that you should know that I think are consistent with the, some of the underlying issues and why we must be serious about addressing them 
is not only about the education system, the healthcare system, the fact that we've got to deal with climate change. Over 40% of the American families today are $400 away, $400 away from a personal crisis that could lead to bankruptcy. We have 5 million young people in America, mostly African American and Hispanic, are not in school, not in work. One out of eight people in America go home every night without the ability to have food in their refrigerator. We have an opioid crisis that is out of control. We have a mental health crisis. We have a homelessness crisis. So all of these issues that have not been dealt with for many years because of political lack of will and the two-party system's core belief that their willingness to solve these problems are subordinated by their self-preservation and self-interest and self-ideology are not going to be solved if a Democrat wins the White House in 2020, regardless of who it is, because the system is rigged, the system is corrupt, and every American must understand how fragile this moment is and the need to transform, disrupt the system with a centrist approach. Now, there are millions of people who are saying to me, this can't be done, this is a fool's errand, this is a vanity project, this is narcissism. Ladies and gentlemen, I love this country. I'm living proof of the American dream. I came from public housing. I came from nothing. My story, like many of you in the room, could only happen in America. But it is not an entitlement. Our, the American dream, the promise of the country, it's not an entitlement. We have to earn it. And right now, if we don't start recognizing how fragile this moment is, and get serious about solving these problems with real solutions that are not fantasy and Alice in Wonderland ideas, we're going to be in serious trouble. A hundred million people did not vote in 2016. A hundred million. And they didn't vote. Apathy and because they had what they believed to be a, a poor choice. I want to give them a better choice in 2020. I want to give a hundred million people a reason to vote and I want to galvanize the millions of people who are going to turn 18 for the first time and give them an opportunity to vote for somebody who will solve these problems. So you brought, you brought up a lot there, and I want to unpack that, and that'll probably take 40 minutes to unpack. Um, and I want to talk about viability. I want to talk about policy specifics. I want to talk about um, enthusiasm uh, and building enthusiasm. But I want to start with the, the critique of Democrats moving towards socialism. Not, it's a wide field. I mean, we're talking somewhere between 17 to 20 candidates by the time everything's said and done, mm -hmm. including a Joe Biden, who says, he, you know, his advisors say he's 95% of the way toward getting in. Not every Democrat is a democratic socialist or a socialist. So you've been asked the question many times before, why not jump into the Democratic primary and have this debate there? Well, I think the Democratic Party has left me, but it's, it's less about the Democratic Party and much more about the system being broken. I don't believe that anyone uh, can restore the level of dysfunction, polarization, and corruptness by being a member of the party, the system needs to be disrupted. I also believe that for Mayor Bloomberg, uh, who has been an extraordinary business person, great mayor in New York City, for him to realize that there was no place for him in the Democratic Party, I think is a litmus test that the party has gone so far to left. Now, uh, Beto, Biden, uh, Hickenlooper, let's see what happens, but uh, it really is, appears to me the Democratic Party has decided that the way to beat Donald Trump is a far left socialistic agenda that I think is a bad strategy, not only for defeating Trump, but worse than that, a terrible, terrible position to put the American people in, and I think the American people are going to reject it. I guess what I wonder is, is there, a, is there like a spectrum, is there a whiteboard with all of the candidates moving from like mo on the Democratic side, moving from moderate to socialist, and is there like a line where you say, okay, if this person's the nominee, I'm getting out, and if this person's the nominee, I'm staying in? 
No, I think, well, first off, I think what you're going to see in the primary is that they're going to go left of each other. I don't know how far more left they can go, but they're going to go left of each other. But at this moment in time, I'm not concerning myself with who the nominee is going to be, who's running. I'm spending the next three to four months traveling the country, uh, listening to the American people, learning. Uh, I've had, you know, I spoke at SMU this week to a very large crowd. I've had small groups of 10 and 12 people. Uh, this week, probably the highlight of the week was speaking to a group of veterans and spouses, post 9-11 veterans, an area that I've been deeply involved with my wife for the last 10 years. Uh, but I'm trying to do everything I can to really understand with a great level of sensitivity and empathy uh, what the American people are facing and, and try and figure out how to solve the problem. Uh, but I, I, I think the next question you're going to ask is viability. So can I get into that and talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, but let me let me let me put it let me put it this yeah. way. The day after you announced, yeah. Nate Silver's team at 538 did a podcast, and they opened the podcast with someone saying, "Everyone says Howard Schultz has a zero percent chance. Yeah. I don't believe that. He might have a one percent chance." Oh, one percent. Those are really those are really really yeah. long odds. How many entrepreneurs are in the room today, and people told you your idea, your dream? could not come true. How many? Okay. Okay. I, I am with you. I am with you because we live in America where anything is possible. We live in America where our dreams can come true. So don't let anyone tell you your dreams can't come true. No one. And, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to allow the pundits, the cynics, to tell me that what I believe needs to happen in America is not possible. This is a critical, critical moment for all of us. And I'm going to do my best to stand up and represent what I believe is a vast majority of the American people who no longer have a voice. And I'm going to try and give them a voice. And let's see what happens. Uh, so I've worked at CNN and now NBC, and I have a lot of colleagues who do this on television. And when the candidate stands up, sometimes they stand up and sometimes they remain seated. And I'm in a really awkward position because I don't know how that looked. That you were like, yeah, sorry, giving this like I didn't mean to stand up emotional but, appeal you know. for centrism, and I'm like, chilling. Okay. Um, okay. Theory of the case. Yeah. Okay. Theory of the case. So um, first off, a. a a NBC poll came out this week that's gotten a lot of press that said 32% of the American people want a new choice other than a Democrat and Republican. So I felt pretty good about that. Uh, but the theory of the case is the following. 30% of the electorate are registered independents. An additional 12% say they would affiliate themselves as an independent if they had a legitimate choice. Now, that's not to say that 42% of the people would likely vote for an independent, but there is a huge market out there that is larger than either Democrat or Republican Party. That's one thing. Second thing is that for the past 30 plus years, every presidential election has been basically decided by eight to 10 battleground states. So that if you live in Arizona and you're a Democrat, your vote doesn't really matter. If you're a Republican in California, your vote doesn't really matter because it's predetermined red or blue state. Not to mention the gerrymandering issue, which is a whole other problem based on the rigged political system that has been established for us. So if I enter the race, and Texas is a perfect example. Texas has not gone Democrat since 19... 90, 19, uh, 1976, Jimmy Carter. If I were to enter the race, there's a good chance that Donald Trump would not win the state of Texas. If he does not win the state of Texas, the math strongly suggests he cannot get to 270 and get reelected. But the, but the true story about this whole thing is, if I enter the race, about 40, 45 states for the first time in 30 plus years are up for grabs because it is not predetermined. And that means that everyone's vote, everyone's voice matters. That is the expression of our democracy that we need. So when people say, I'm going to be a spoiler, 
it's a false narrative for two reasons. One, we know that lifelong Republicans do not want to reelect Donald Trump because of a lack of character, a lack of dignity, a lack of civility, and all the things that he has destroyed in terms of the respect of the Oval Office. But given the choice between Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, all well-intentioned people, those Republicans are going to vote and re-elect Donald Trump. If you put me in the race, it could very well be a third, a third, a third, and all of a sudden, this entire situation is very, very different. So in 1987, Starbucks had 11 stores and 100 employees, and people said, there's no way this could travel outside of Seattle. People told me that a venture capitalist would never give me money if we gave health care to every employee, if we gave ownership. They thought we were crazy three years ago when I said, we've got to find a way to crack the code, even though no one's ever done it, to give free college tuition to every employee. And we did all of that, and Starbucks stock since 1992 is up almost 25,000%. Not because we're smarter than anyone else, no, because we were able to create the balance, a fragile balance, between a fiduciary responsibility and the humanity of our organization and learning two things, that not every business decision is an economic one and that success is best when it's shared. So building Starbucks is not a proxy for... <laughs> Thank you. B building Starbucks is not a proxy for running the country. But what it is a proxy for is the kind of leadership that I have displayed, the fact that I understand how to bring people together, and that my passion and commitment to what is going on in America, I want to address in a way that I think is correct, because we need to reimagine how the government is structured. So I, I want to, one, one last question about viability, and then I actually want to jump into the Starbucks okay. um, experience and talk about that a little bit. You mentioned Kamala Harris. You mentioned a three-way split. If it's September, October 1st, 2020, and it's 30% Harris, 30% Schultz, 30% Trump, 10% undecided in the polls, what do you do? Do you stay in or do you get out? It's a tough hypothetical to answer, but what I've said time and time again uh, is that I will do nothing to reelect Donald Trump. So if the math doesn't work and there's any indication whatsoever that there's great risk to my being in the race that would re-elect Donald Trump, I would not proceed. But I am a long way from making that kind of decision. So, and you, you have said that before, and the reason when I talk to Democrats that they are not comforted by that is because there are different definitions of how you might interpret what your chances are. And, you know, one statistic that gets off, is off-sided for third-party candidates is that at one point in the summer of 1992, Ross Perot was leading over Clinton and Bush. Uh, I think he had something like 39%. Mm. That was a pretty good, if I'm the candidate, if I'm Perot, I'm thinking, yeah. let's do this. By the time you get around to election day, he does not win a single state, only comes in second place in yeah. two or three states, and in the rest he comes in third. Well, there's a, there's a big difference between 2020 and 1992. The country, certainly in my lifetime, has never been this divided. The American people have never been more dissatisfied. Our political system and two parties have never been more dysfunctional. And I think the American people agree with me. They, they want to see another choice. So I want to play this out, and I want to travel the country and see if there's a national agreement. I want to see if I can galvanize young people across the country. And uh, it's too early to, to answer these kinds of questions. Uh, and I think a lot of things are going to happen between now and the next 18 months. And chances are between the investigation of the special prosecutor, the Democrats, whether they're going to uh, move to impeach, uh, things could actually get a lot worse uh, during the next 18 months which could provide me with the even bigger opportunity to present myself to the American people. So let's, let's uh, jump into policy and let's do it by way of Starbucks. You mentioned free uh, healthcare, free college tuition. You were against these things as government enforced policy proposals, yeah. but you seem to have this vision that somehow if you were president that businesses would start to emulate the Starbucks model and maybe 
do better by their workers yeah. and that you would effectively outsource I, 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 many of the proposals on the on the left are for government right. to take responsibility for this your theory is that business should take responsibility for this how does you being in the white house get every business in america to say yeah sure we'll give free health care yeah. and free college tuition to our employees so let, let me try and uh, you've said a few things that are true and a few things that are not quite right so uh, as a journalist that could get me fired so uh, so, <laughs> so let me let me try and explain how i see all these things uh, so first off Unequivocally, let me say, there's nothing free in America. So uh, these proposals about Medicare for all and free college and a, a government job for everybody, that is not free. So someone is gonna have to pay for that and that means that taxes for everyone is gonna have to go up or someone's gonna have to wave a magic wand and do something that doesn't exist, but that has to be paid for by somebody. And the difficulty in trying to pay for any of that is we're sitting with $22 trillion of debt that has to be addressed. So it's, it's, it's not realistic. Now, this is what I believe. I thought President Obama's position and his administration regarding the Affordable Care Act was absolutely the right thing to do. It gave over 20 million people health insurance who did not have it, and it created an opportunity that I thought was consistent with the humanity of the country. I believe that every American should have the right for affordable health care. However, since the Affordable Care Act has been in place, premiums have almost doubled for American families. That is unacceptable. Now, why has that happened? That's happened in large part because the insurance industry and the pharmaceutical industry is not playing fair with the American people. As an example, the government is not able to negotiate pharmaceutical drug prices with pharma. That's a mistake. That's not right, especially when very few people understand that European countries are buying those same pharmaceutical products that we are paying much more for at a less price than we are. So there has to be transparency and an ability to negotiate with pharma. Why are we unable to do that? The fact is that the majority of people who are making these rules up are taking money from the special interest of the pharma companies and so they are unwilling to take them on. The same thing is true with the insurance agencies and the insurance industry. So members of Congress are taking special interest money, and in a way you can say, the fox is in the hen house, and this is what's wrong. So the Democrats and Republicans are complicit every single day in not representing the American people because they are more concerned about getting reelected. And in order to get reelected, they've got to take the money from these companies and unwilling to do what's right for the American people. So we've got to go back in and fix the Affordable Care Act by doing what's right with pharma and the insurance companies. With regard to business, I think there is a growing crisis of capitalism in the country. That doesn't mean we should run to the extreme of saying every company in America is bad or capitalism is bad and we should rush to socialism. But I do believe that because the government is $22 trillion in debt, the government can't solve all these problems. So if I ran for president and was fortunate enough to win, I would be doing everything I could to convince businesses in America that they have a moral obligation to do more for their people and the communities they serve. In addition to that, I thought that President Trump made a terrible mistake when he lowered the corporate tax rate from 35 to 21 percent and basically did not take advantage of the opportunity for a comprehensive tax reform and infrastructure development. But the problem with the 21 percent was it did not include any incentive to do anything for your people, for the communities you serve, for retraining, for education. So if I was president, 
corporate tax rate would be higher and there would be an opportunity to get a lower corporate tax rate if you do the right thing for your employees, including what's necessary. And, and I, I, I have a track record of the last almost 40 years of doing it and demonstrating that you can do both. You can create shareholder value and you can create value for your people. We've also learned something at Starbucks that by doing good things to your people, your customers are gonna build a large reservoir of trust around the equity of the brand because they wanna support a company whose values are compatible with their own. But the short answer is businesses are gonna to need to do more for their people and the communities they serve than they have in the past. And I think I can, I can convince businesses in America to do that because it will be in their interest. I also believe we need to raise taxes on the wealthy and, and we need to raise tax rate on corporate America and create- By how much? I don't know what the number is. I mean, people a lot smarter than me, but clearly our tax system is out of whack. And we have to do everything we possibly can to narrow the gap of inequality in America. And that is producing the divisiveness, that is producing the rhetoric, and that's also producing the incitement of the Democratic Party trying to reach those Trump voters with levels of extremism that is not true, it's not real, and it's not gonna be effective. We need sensible solutions, thoughtfulness, compassion, empathy, but we need to have solutions that are real, not fantasy. So I want to, I'm going to ask you one more question, but while I'm doing it, if, if you want to throw some questions up on the screen, great. I'll take a look at those in a second. Then I want to reserve five or ten minutes at the end to talk to you about something. Um, the gridlock you describe is real. The partisanship you describe is real. Uh, the, the policies you are proposing sound appealing, but being a CEO of a company is different than having to work with the levers of government. What, you know, if you, is the idea that somehow you would just arrive in Washington and you would have such a mandate from the people because you pulled this off that therefore everyone on both sides of the aisle would have to listen to the guy who they all sort of universally don't want to run for president? <laughs> well, let, 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 me, uh, let me get some audience participation for a moment if I can. Uh, raise your hand if you think the government is working well for you and your family and the American people. Raise your hand. We have one. We got two. I see two. Okay, so I think there's, I don't know, is there a thousand people here? I think more. Roughly? Yeah. Okay, so in a thousand people, I think I see less than 10 hands of people who believe that the U.S. government and our representatives and the president is working well for you and your family and the American people. So the first thing is we can probably all agree, and I've been doing this almost in every town hall across the country. And this is the same kind of response. There is an agreement that things are not working well and we need to change. So let's start there. Now the question is, no, I'm not gonna ride on a horse into Washington and all of a sudden I'm gonna be able to change everything, no. But can you imagine this? Can you imagine for the first time, literally since George Washington, that the American people would have spoken so loudly that they are disgusted and exhausted by what is going on and they are going to send an independent thinker, a centrist to Washington, and tell Congress and all the elected officials that we the people, we the people, have spoken up and we want dramatic, disruptive, transformational change in our government that serves the American people. And if I had that at, at my back, I believe that the will of the people would create an opportunity for significant change. I also believe two other things. I believe that currently there are good Republicans and good Democrats who are unwilling to vote their conscience or their heart because they're told every day, if you step out of your level, your narrow team of ideology, we're gonna come after you and we're gonna primary you out. And that's why they can't vote their heart and conscience. But if an independent president gets elected, you're gonna see those good people move outside of that ideology because they're gonna have license to do it. You're also gonna see something else. You're gonna see an array 
of new candidates from all over the country, congressmen, senators, for the first time, in waves, start running, not as a Democrat or as a Republican, but as an independent centrist representing the will of the majority of the American people. That's what's going to happen. All right, I want to, I want to address a few of these questions, and then we'll, and then we'll get back to the one last thing. Uh, oh, are you pro-life or are you pro-choice? I have been uh, an advocate of being pro-choice uh, my entire life. Uh, that's the rule of the land. Uh, I think this is an issue that's been established. I don't think it's going to be an issue uh, for me in terms of what I stand for and what I'm talking about. Uh, not unlike the question that I've gotten a couple of times now is, uh, is the country ready for a Jewish president? Uh -huh. I think the, the, the country is ready for a Jewish president. Uh, I'm not running as someone who's Jewish. If I run for president, I'm running as an American. Uh, who happens to be Jewish, and I've been public for years saying that I believe that the solution in the Middle East between the Palestinians and the Israelis should be a two-state solution, although that's not the case today. I think that would be the best way forward, and if I was president, that's something I would be working towards. Here's a question that, that's good. Can you define socialism? Can I define socialism? Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, It's interesting that you would laugh at that. I think they might be laughing because the person who asked the question is listed as a German. Oh, it was in, Ger it was in German? Just a German. Oh. <laughs> well, if you, if you want a good description for socialism, I think just look at Venezuela. Um, it's a, uh, you don't like that? Well, uh, we do not, we, we don't want a government takeover of our lives. We want the freedom of, of being able to pursue happiness in America, the pursuit of happiness. We want our independence. We want our free enterprise to be sustainable. Capitalism has created more jobs, has moved more people out of poverty, and created the greatest system in the world, which is America. Is it perfect? No. Does it need to be refined? Yes. Do businesses have a moral obligation in addition to making money? Yes. Any business today that is in business just to make money is going to be shallow. It's not enduring. You're not going to attract and retain great people. But those businesses that achieve the fragile balance between profit and humanity and understand that the gifts of business is to lift people up and create opportunity for everyone, that is a system that I embrace. That is a system that I'm for. And anything that has to do with things that suggest that everything is going to be free and we're going to live in a world that is, that is inconsistent with the heritage of the country is wrong. And it's, it's, it's an extreme position, and it's just not who we are, it's not who we have been, and it's not who we should be. On the, on the capitalism front, you, there, there is this, we're, we are sort of living in a moment in which you could argue that, at least on the left, capitalism is under attack. Billionaires, yeah. or can I say billionaires? <laughs> I know you like you're, people of means. You're the host. <laughs> Uh, but, but why, why uh, you know, I, I have succeeded in America because of the American system. For everyone in this room who is an entrepreneur who's trying to be successful, your success should be celebrated, not vilified. But with, with success comes responsibility. Do you, do you at least empathize with the sort of immense frustration with, you know, income inequality. Yes. I mean, that, that, that frustration with billionaires comes from somewhere, and it's somewhere very real and serious, and it's very real and serious for a lot of people. I, I not only do I empathize with it, and am I, do I understand it, but I've tried my entire life 
at Starbucks to recognize that success has to be shared. Uh, my wife and I have worked diligently for the last 20 years to do everything we can for Opportunity Youth and for post 9-11 veterans. We haven't really talked about that. Uh, but with success comes a great responsibility. Uh, but I also think that this president uh, has created the impression uh, of a lack of character, a lack of morality, a lack of compassion and empathy for other people, and just happens to be someone who, is, who was a business person, who was successful, but he is not the poster child for most people in America who have achieved great success. In fact, he's a poster child for everything that is wrong. A lack of character, a lack of dignity, a lack of civility. And I think the, the institution of the Oval Office is at great stake because it creates the tonality for the character of the nation and it creates the character of the nation outside of America. More, more than any one policy, is this what you are running, like if, if you had to say in one sentence what you are running on, is it restoring dignity? Is that, is that the primary uh, value proposition here? I would say it's restoring trust and confidence in America and what we stand for, restoring faith in the promise of the country and the American dream, and certainly doing everything possible to restore honor and dignity in the Oval Office. But underneath all that is the significant systemic challenges we have domestically and as well as our standing in the world. This president, in less than two years, has done so much to fracture our relationship with our allies, create problems with Mexico and Canada, create a trade and tariff war in China, a sham, a charade in terms of these fake summits in North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these things are gonna be with us for a long time. We are not gonna know the downstream effects on young people who have been desensitized by being imprinted constantly with one episode after another of a lack of leadership, a lack of truth, and the fact that this president stands for things that we know are inconsistent with the values of our country. You mentioned that you wanted to talk about 9-11 veterans really yes. quick. Talk about that really quick. I'm gonna ask one more question from the screen and then one more thing and then we'll okay. be done. Um, I, I had the good fortune over the last 10 years of having Secretary Gates on the Starbucks board and uh, he, he educated my wife and I about the challenges that post 9-11 veterans were gonna have coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And we were in a focus group uh, not too long ago, and we heard a young serviceman who was transitioning out say something, and he said, I have more anxiety, more nervousness about going on a job interview than I would if I was being sent back to Afghanistan. And when we heard that, we realized we, we really had to do something to try and help. And so, uh, not unlike Opportunity Youth, uh, post 9-11 veterans have so much to offer our society, but they don't have a way back in because they're misunderstood. And a lot of them are coming back with some issues that have to be dealt with. Starbucks has hired 20,000 uh, veterans and or spouses. Uh, our family foundation has built uh, 18 transitional training centers on bases. Uh, we have uh, built 50 stores adjacent to Basis, but the real issue here and the opportunity is for all of us to understand uh, that many of us did not have uh, much engagement in these wars. Many of us don't know anybody who actually served in these wars. And we, we have a moral obligation to really respect what they, what they and their family did. And the thing that hurts me the most is when these young, extraordinary people take off the cloth of the nation and come home they're not being served properly by our society, by businesses, and specifically, and this will be a shocker for all of you, uh, when you, we had a town hall uh, with, with veterans and families in San Antonio, and one subject that came up was the concern that they had and others had the day before in Dallas about the VA. And uh, I don't know how many people know what the VA budget is, but the VA budget is 200 billion dollars. And if you talk to most post 9-11 veterans, 
what they talk about and what they're concerned about and what they get really agitated about is they just don't feel that they've been respected and they're getting treatment that is consistent what they've, in, what, in, in what they have sacrificed for the nation. But if you want a litmus test for a government takeover of anything, look at the VA, a $200 billion agency that is more bureaucratic and more dysfunctional than perhaps any that we have. And so uh, this brings to mind something else, and that is the commander in chief, the president of the United States, not only has the solemn responsibility of making the most difficult decision of all to, to send young men and women into harm's way, but the commander in chief has a moral solemn obligation to ensure the fact that when these people come home, we take care of them. And the truth, ladies and gentlemen, is we have not done a very good job of that. And we are all individually and collectively responsible for that because they have sacrificed so much for us, for our families, and the United States of America. Question from the audience. What was the most important decision you made when building Starbucks into a leading global brand? I think the most important decision was uh, cracking the code uh, on creating ownership for everyone in the company, and we did that when we were private and losing money. And what we did basically is we figured out a way to give everyone at Starbucks, including part-time people, 14% of their base pay in the form of stock options. And so every single year, uh, people got a grant of 14% of their base pay. And what that did is demonstrated that although uh, people who were investing in the company thought that might be dilutive, what it did was demonstrate that if you're going to give ownership to every single employee, you're going to create a culture, a set of values and guiding principles in which everyone is going to be facing in the same direction. There's going to be less attrition, higher performance, and uh, what, what occurred in terms of the success of the company is directly linked to the fact that we are all owners in the company. And that had never been done before for part-time workers. That was the unlock. The, the secret of Starbucks is not the, spa, the fact that we're sourcing and roasting what we believe the highest quality coffee in the world and the real estate and design. The secret is the culture and values and guiding principles of the company, the level of behavior, and how people are treated. We're not perfect, we make mistakes. You know, we, we employ 400,000 people and have 30,000 stores, but we've demonstrated over a 40 year period that culture really does matter, and that has been the secret sauce of the company. So on that note, the, the last sort of thing I wanna focus on is about branding, branding and marketing and engagement, but it's not Starbucks, it's you. Yeah. And your, the, the appeal you've made to the audience today, the appeal you've made in, in, the, in the town halls and the TV appearances you've done, it is, it's common sense centrism. The polling would suggest that there is actually an audience for it. But at the end of the day, the people who run for president and win have more than, than the policies they're proposing, have more than a platform. They've got, I interviewed Jeffrey Katzenberg yesterday and he referred to it as camera charisma. You gotta have uh, there's got to be something that lights a fire under people and gets them to turn out. And I think one of the, th what I'm sort of curious about in, in terms of thinking about viability and, and, and those things is, you know, Barack Obama ran on Yes We Can and, and Trump ran on Make America Great Again. And some of the slogans I'm trying to, you know, as I hear you talk, it's like, that's never going to happen is not a great campaign slogan. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and, and I also think, ha, have you thought, as, as the leader of a major global brand, have you thought about how you are going to make Howard Schultz the sort of sensible centrist policy guy into Howard Schultz the zeitgeist? What, like, who is going to be your shepherd fairy and make posters of you? How, when, when are people gonna start walking around with your face on their t-shirts and their hats? What does it take to engage the nation when what you are effectively arguing is that the system is broken and the promises that are being made aren't gonna be kept, what are you gonna do? Yeah, 
Uh, well, first off, this is my fifth week uh, since 60. Does it feel like five weeks or does it feel uh, no, like it five years? It feels a little longer. <laughs> uh, it's my fifth week since 60 Minutes. Uh, I have not officially said that I'm running for president. Uh, I think if you're going to give me a little bit of credit, you'd have to say that over the course of the last 40 years, I know a little bit about building a brand. Yeah, I'd give uh, you, I would, uh, I would give you that. Uh, I would give you that. A uh, hundred million people this week went into Starbucks stores. We have 4,000 stores in China. We open a store every day. Starbucks was just named the fifth most admired and respected company in the world. Uh, I know a little bit about marketing. Yeah. Um, so uh, give me some time uh, to kind of uh, feel my way through. Uh, when we get to the point that if I'm going to announce that I'm running for president, you'll be the first to hear what the slogan is. Great. <laughs> Can I, you know, I got a more important thing. This, this is what I really want to know. The Democrats have the donkey. Yeah. And the Republicans have the elephant. <laughs> What's your spirit animal, Howard? <laughs> What's your, like... <laughs> uh, I'll take any suggestions you have. <laughs> uh, but I... <laughs> a unicorn. A unicorn. That's like uh, a backhanded thing, a unicorn. I, uh... I, what I want to say is uh, I, I understand the question and the seriousness of it and how important that's going to be. Uh, what I'm focused on right now, truthfully, is the goodness and kindness of the American people, the faith I have in them to recognize good from bad and extreme from extreme and what we need to do. And I'm going to do my best over the next few months to uh, uh, reach out to the American people and present myself in a way that is not really slogan-based and marketing-based. People might, may not believe, people may not agree with what I'm saying or like what I'm gonna say, uh, but at this stage in my life, uh, I'm gonna say what I believe, I'm gonna say uh, what I believe is true and what I think is important, and we'll see what happens. So, that's great. Do you, do you, um, I imagine your family is behind you. I imagine your friends are behind you. I imagine you have a lot of people who tell you that what you are doing is good and noble. Do you have people in your life who come to you and tell you, Howard, rethink this, you're embarrassing yourself, step down, <laughs> don't, don't do this to the country right now? Are there, are there, are there those people around uh, you or is everybody gung-ho? Right no, I, I think when you try and do something that uh, has not been done before, that this has this steep of a climb and is against the grain, uh, certainly you're gonna have a group of people that believe this is not the thing to do or not something uh, that could turn out well. Uh, but I, I, this is where I believe I need to be. This is where my life has led me. Uh, I've had the same group of friends for the past 30, 40 years, uh, some of whom have been traveling with me over the last couple of weeks. Uh, my wife has been with me all the way through. Uh, we know how hard this is. We know how difficult it is. But most importantly, we know how critical this is at this moment in the history of our country. So there are two minutes left, and this is where I employ the great privilege of having made it through 58 minutes on here with, I think, what was hopefully an insightful and enjoyable conversation. Thank you very much. Hope. Thank you. Um, I'm going... I'm going to exercise the moderator's privilege yeah. and say, I grew up in Seattle, and I really would love it. I mean, I would kill for a basketball team. Yeah. And, and I'm not mad at you, because I know there's a lot of stuff that went down, and not all the coverage of how that went down was fair. But as somebody who's worked in the world of sports, do you anticipate, just given market demand, given the size, the growth of Seattle, the tech boom in Seattle, Will there be a National Basketball Association team in Seattle within the next five years? Yeah, I, I think uh, the new commissioner, Adam Silver, is open to the idea, and there's a lot of people in Seattle. We just got a, uh, a, a professional hockey team is coming to Seattle. I think that's a good first step. Uh, I, I believe there will be an NBA team coming back to Seattle. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. <laughs>
Thank you very much.